The I-35W Mississippi River Bridge was a 1,907-foot-long steel truss arch bridge in Minneapolis, Minnesota. On Wednesday, August 1, 2007, at 6.05 p.m., it experienced a catastrophic failure in its central deck truss span, causing the deck and bridge and adjacent sections of the approach span supported by the deck to plummet into the Mississippi River. Of the 190 people that were believed to be on the bridge at the time of collapse, 13 people died and 145 people were injured. The bridge collapsed when a loss of structural support from the bending and fracturing of the U-10 gusset plates caused the U-10 nodes to drop downward. This downward displacement resulted in bending loads that fractured the gusset plates between the upper cord members, leading to a cascading failure throughout the bridge. The cause of the collapse was twofold. The U-10 gusset plates were inadequately designed due to a calculation error from the original bridge design firm, causing the U-10 gusset plates to be half the thickness they should have been. Gusset plates that met the design specifications would have retained a significant margin of safety under the loads on the bridge of the day of the collapse. This error may have remained unnoticed if it wasn't for additional weight on the barriers, guardrails, and pavement added to the bridge since its construction, along with the multitude of construction equipment that was on the bridge at the time of collapse. Today, we'll be focusing on a simplified version of the loading pattern on gusset plate U10 to determine how the calculation error led to this accident. So today we'll be focusing on one of the gusset plates of the bridge, particularly uh, this one over here. So we have a 312 kip force on it. Uh, it's double plated, so there's a plate on the other side of this. Um, so if we want to calculate that out, we can use a Whitmore area. So starting from the bolt over here, we can go out at about a 30 degree angle on each side and stop at the bolt over here. And then this will be our effective area for our shear forces and all of our other calculations for now. This is overly simplifying it, but it will give us the numbers we need. So, Using the Whitmore calculation, we end up with a plate of 29.52 inches on the height and 17.735 inches for the width. So there's a few things we should get out of the way before we start our calculations. Bridges usually have a safety factor of about six. So that means all the materials are designed to handle about six times the amount of force that should normally be applied to them. And we know the type of steel for the bolts and for the gusset plate. So the bolts are using, uh, we have A325 bolts. You cannot spell bolts. And uh, their yield is equal to 92 KSI. And we also have A36 steel for the gusset plate, and that yield is equal to 36 KSI. For the, it differs between uh, different thicknesses, but for the thicknesses we're going to be ranging between these values should be fairly accurate. Oh, and also our bolt diameter is equal to 7 eighths inch. So each of those 20 bolts that is on our uh, thing over here, so all of these, those are 20 and they're all 7 eighths of an inch in diameter. And also before we start, we have to remember why we're here. Why the, did the bridge collapse? Now, it really comes down to a multitude of different factors, but it was mostly the under designing of the gusset plates on the bridge. So our thickness was supposed to be around one inch for gusset plate U10. However, the design vapor miscalculated and we were left with gusset plates with only about half an inch. So we basically halved 
the thickness of our gusset plates and we're, we're going to see how that affects the end stress and how that effect affects our factor of safety which remind you that's supposed to be around six and if we're dipping below it then there could be issues like we did see all right so the first thing we want to deal with now is our normal stress so normal stress and that's going to be the force on the plate as it gets pulled by our force. So we're going to have our equation, which is plate is equal to our force P over A net. Now, uh, there's a few things we should consider before we start. Now, from uh, the class, we've only been dealing with plates that have one bolt in them. And the process isn't really that different uh, for a gusset plate with multiple bolts. And really, it comes down to paths of failure in the bolt. So technically, I suppose we could have a failure from here to here, right? And it goes through two bolts, and our A net is going to be uh, 29.52 minus these two bolts right here. However, that's not the lowest net area we can get away with, and it wouldn't make sense for the plate to fail here without it being it failing somewhere else that is more vulnerable. So we can try and go through and figure out some different paths for our fracture to take place. And as you see, uh, it's pretty much four bolts. So we can go straight down. We can sort of angle ourselves through. We could maybe angle around somewhere else, but I think for the most part, our area or our our track of failure that is most most vulnerable to our normal stress is probably going to be around one of these where we're going to have four bolts contributing to a loss of net area. So now that we know our track is actually going to go through four bolts, we can start calculating our net area. So I'll do a little diagram here. Uh, the red is the four bolts that will take a chunk out of our A net. And then the blue is all the area we want to make our A net. All right. So we know our air force over our A net, which is going to be thickness times, uh, we know thickness, we have 29.52 inches here. So 29.52 minus 4 times the bolt diameter, which is 7 eighths. And we'll get our net area from that. Now, one other thing we need to consider here is the fact that these plates over here, there should be, if I was to sort of draw it a little bit, so you can sort of see it, there's another plate on the other side. So basically identical, it's gonna be sharing the force in between the two plates. So basically our force is gonna get cut in half. So we know our P is equal to 312 kips. We're gonna have 312 divided by two. So calculating it all out, we'll get plate is equal to 156 kips over 26.02 inches. Well, actually, since it's going to be multiplied by T, inches squared. 
Okay. So our plate, so let's say we have our um, thickness of one, which it should have been one. So we're going to get 156 kips over 26.02 inches squared, which is going to equal We're going to get around 6 KSI. Now, uh, from our steel yield, we know that our factor of safety is 6, right? So 6 KSI times a factor of 6 says that we should design our structure for 36 KSI or our gusset plate for 36 KSI of stress to keep with that safety factor. And you'll actually find that it's very, very close to our steel yield stress, which is over here. So with a properly designed gusset plate of one inch, it's very likely that our bridge would be up to our specification. However, However, our bridge wasn't designed with this proper thickness. Uh, we have a plate with 0.5 inches. Now that's going to basically cut this in half. So 156 kips over 13.01 inches squared. We get 12 KSI as expected in the plate. Now, if we multiply that by 6, we know we're going to get way more than that. We're going to get 72 KSI, which is greater than the 36 KSI yield on our A36 steel. So that's not, uh, that's not great. Uh, we find out that we only have... have a factor of safety equal to three when we have this thinner gusset plate. So that's one of the huge problems with this bridge is we were piling construction equipment and additional weight on this bridge. And you think you have a face safety factor of six, but over time, uh, and over time, this would drop due to corrosion or material degradation. But uh, we're going to um, sort of focus on this more and see how the safety factor was basically cut in half. All right, so we're ready to focus on the shearing stresses in our bolts. So basically right here, we have, um, you can count them, there are 20 bolts there. It's a five by four row if you rearrange some of the bolts. So we know each plate equals 20 bolts. And um, basically we know they're seven eighths of an inch. And uh, yeah, we know our uh, yield strength for them is going to be 92 KSI. So our yield is 92 KSI. KSI. All right. So on our structure, we're going to have our gusset plate right here. We're going to have our member here. We're going to have another gusset plate because remember there's two, there's one on each side. And our, we know our total force here is 316 kips. All right, of tension. And we have our bolts here. I'll just put one because I really don't want to draw 20 bolts. So we have our bolt here, right? And we're going to experience shearing stress at uh, this surface 
and at this surface over here. Because if we do a cross section of the bolts, we have an area of the bolts here, right? This is 7 eighths of an inch across. We're going to have a shearing stress. So if we kind of rotate the bolts, so we're looking down from up here. We're going to have a shearing stress, which is kind of pushing it this way with some force P or whatever. And so this is going to be our shear area. And the thing is, now that we know that there's 20 bolts on each side, right? So we know there's 20 bolts. We can actually just combine the shear areas for all of these bolts because we know we, they all act the same. It's basically like one big bolt, give or take. So we can sort of combine them all. And we know that there are two shear surfaces. There's one up here and one up here. So we can multiply them by two because for every, every bolt, there are two shear surfaces, there are 20 bolts, and then we have our area. So we've gotten the steps to sort of figure out where it can be. So using that, we can find our shear on the bolts. So let's do that. Bolts. And we know that's going to be our force over Rn. So we're going to have 20 bolts. We're going to have 7 eighths of an inch diameter. So we know that's pi over 4. 7 eighths squared. And then we just multiply it by 2. And that will be our net area. So basically for our shear strength of the bolt, we're going to have 316 kips over 24.05 inches squared. And uh, this really doesn't change with the thickness. So we can sort of calculate it out for it's not going to change. And the bolts weren't the failure points on the bridge. So that sort of makes sense why we're not focusing as much on it. All right, so calculating that out, uh, we have and we get 13.14 kips on bolts. Now for the kips, uh, we know our yield strength for bolts are uh, not about 92 KSI. So if we do that, let's see what our factor of safety will get us. So 3.14 kips times six is equal to 78.84 kips. So this is what we should design for at least if we want a factor of safety of six. And as you can see, 78.84 is less than 92 KSI. So our factor of safety is A-OK, -okay, even with the gusset plate not being as thick. But as we know, it wasn't the bolts that failed, it was the gusset plate. All right, so we have our, uh, our final stress we're going to be calculating for this plate. And it's going to be the bearing stress. So basically, when we have our plate, right? We're going to have a force acting on it 
and then the bolts inside are going to kind of crush up against the sides of these holes and that's what we're calling bearing stress. All right, so we know that on one of the plates we have 20 holes, right? 20 holes. And we know that our uh, P is gonna be P over two, which is 156 kips, I believe. Six divided by two, oh, 158 kips. Oops. So we know that we can get our bearing stress Oh, it's already implied in the name. Uh, so stress bearing is going to be our 158 kips over. So we're going to have to find the area or the A net for this, which isn't too bad. So I'll just draw a little cross section of our plate and a hole of one of the bolts just to show you. So we have our thickness over here. And we have the diameter of the hole, which we know is 7 eighths of an inch. So basically, we're just trying to find this area that the plate is kind of, kind of the bolts in the plate are uh, compressing upon. So with our thickness, we're going to have the number of these areas. So we know there's going to be 20 in one plate. We know the diameter is 7 eighths of an inch because um, basically like we're not just counting. Um, it might get confusing because we have this circular area here, right? But we're really just trying to make a conservative estimate. So we're not really counting this area we're counting like the area if it had been flat so we kind of have a little bit of a conservative estimate all right so 20 times 7 eighths of an inch and times the thickness so we basically get 158 divided by, uh, well, first we'll do our uh, bearing for one inch, which it should have been designed for, uh, 20 times seven divided by eight. And we get a bearing stress of 9.02 kips. And for bearing of 0.5, we're gonna get exactly twice that. So we're going to get 18.05 kips. And it's pretty similar to the values we were getting uh, before, slightly less. So, so if we multiply them by 6, uh, we get this is 108.34. And our this is going to be 54.17 kips. And we see here again that this is going over our factor of safety of six. So that's really where the problem lies. Our factor of safety has effectively been cut in half by a design error. Now that's not seriously a problem because as we, we've seen through our calculations, we still have a factor of safety of about three. The issue with that is we are expecting a far higher safety factor. So we feel more comfortable adding pavements onto our bridge that may increase the weight. We're more comfortable with adding construction equipment upon the bridge, which may increase the stress on some of the members. So in conclusion, uh, we see that the bridge is still able to hold itself up. Um, the problem remains hidden until the collapse, but um, 
yeah, that's really what it comes down to. Uh, the bridge is perfectly able to hold itself up, but there isn't an appropriate factor of safety to ensure it doesn't catastrophically fail.